Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. This is the last of our series of the seven churches of Revelation. And uh, all of these videos are available up on our YouTube channel, Southwest District MNSDA. So go and, um, and um, leave a comment and uh, let us know that uh, you're listening to them and, and what you're thinking. Uh, all our announcements are up on Facebook and uh, we thank you for your faithfulness and your tithes and your offerings. And as we begin our service today, let's sing Into My Heart. Well, our scripture reading today is from Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22, the message to Laodicea. Karen, want to read that? To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. To whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. The song we'd like to sing for you this morning is uh, By Grace. The message to Laodicea is, is, is a message of, of righteousness by faith. And uh, we need to recognize our need for that. And so we want to sing that for you now. By Grace.
God has prepared for us that we should walk in there. By grace you have been saved. Through faith it is the gift of God. By Well, it's time for our prayer. Shall we bow our heads together? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day, for all the blessings that you have poured into it, for your mighty creative power. We thank you that the creator of the universe is the one who died to save us and is the one who is able to keep us from falling and help us day by day to be more like you. We, we just pray that your Holy Spirit may bless us now and we thank you for your promise to be with us and to bless us and to, to draw us closer to you as we worship. We pray you'll be with all of your people in our, in our district. We just pray that you'll be with them and, and uh, keep them close to you in these days these difficult days, we just pray that you'll bless them and, and make them a blessing. We also pray for your church here in Minnesota, for all the members that um, are representing you. We pray that your Holy Spirit may help them to see their great need of you and to come to you so that they may be saved and be a saving influence to those around them. We pray that you'll be with our our family, with our friends. We think of our children and our grandchildren. We always, they always have a special place in our hearts. And we just pray that you'll, you'll be with us as we worship here now, as we continue to, to worship before your throne, that you will help us and draw us closer to you. Be with all those that are still suffering under this pandemic. We just pray that you'll help those that are in India right now that are, that are really going through so much turmoil and all over the world, Lord. We just pray, we just look forward to the time when all of this is over with. And uh, not only this uh, virus, but sin and, and, and all the sin in this world will be finally taken care of and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So we thank you for being with us now. Thank you for your promises to be with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. My sermon this morning is entitled the Council of the True Witness. Today we come to the last city in our tour, visiting the seven churches of Asia Minor. We began at Ephesus, 
the loveless church. And there we heard the promise from Jesus to him who overcomes and regains his first love, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. And then we went up the coast to Smyrna, the persecuted church. And there we heard the promise, he who overcomes and endures affliction and poverty for my sake, even to the point of death, will not be hurt at all by the second death. From there we went up a little further to Pergamum and a little bit inland to Pergamum, the compromising church. And there Jesus promised to him who overcomes and repents of his compromises with the worldly culture around him will enjoy the hidden manna of personal communion with me in the world to come and will receive a new name reflecting the beauty of my character that he has made his own by faith. Next, we went inland and a little south to Thyatira, the tolerant church. And there, Jesus promised to him who overcomes and takes advantage of his time to repent and determines to do nothing but my will to the end, I will give authority to sit on thrones and judge the wicked. I will give to him myself the morning star as lifelong companion and servant. Leaving there, we came to Sardis, the dead church. And there Jesus promised to him who overcomes and wakes up from the false security of relying on his past experience for his assurance of salvation, he will be dressed in white and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And last time, we stopped at the church in Philadelphia, the missionary church, the church of the open door. And while we were there, Jesus said that when we face closed doors and experience opposition from those who claim to be his followers, but are lying, we can overcome by looking up to the door standing open in heaven and come boldly to the throne of grace in the most holy place to receive help in our time of need. And he promised that those who overcome will one day pass through that door, not just in spirit, but in actuality, to become permanent citizens of the new Jerusalem. And today, as we sit in the pews of the church in Laodicea, we will hear a message that at once contains the most scathing rebuke and yet the most beautiful and loving appeal and promise of all of the seven. It's a message which applies particularly to our day, the last period of church history before Jesus comes. This is the church that Jesus says he is about to spew out of his mouth, Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Whatever could be so terrible about us to make Jesus want to spit us out of his mouth? And what can we do to keep from being spewed out? But first, let's see what we can find out about the original church in Laodicea. Laodicea is located about 50 miles southeast of Philadelphia and 100 miles east of Ephesus, the first church of the seven. It was in a river valley flanked on either side by eight to 9,000 foot mountains. And it was on the main road from Ephesus to the Euphrates River. Laodicea has an interesting historical background that Jesus draws from in order to reach their hearts. It was founded by Antiochus II in the third century BC and was named after his sister and wife, Laodice. During the first 100 years, it was a relatively insignificant city. But in the second century BC, after Asia Minor was formed as a Roman province, it rapidly grew in importance. Laodicea became a business person's paradise. Much of its wealth came from commercial and banking interests. An expensive black wool that was soft and glossy was 
marketed there and processed into prized garments and rugs. It was an enormously wealthy city and was proud of it. In Roman times, around 60 AD, there was a severe earthquake in the area. And Nero, the emperor of Rome, offered them financial assistance to help repair the damage and recover their losses. But Laodicea was so proud and wealthy that they refused, saying that they had enough financial resources to rebuild their own city without outside help. They were also famous for their medical school and an eye ointment that was made from local ingredients. It was also a resort town. Hot springs bubbled out of the hills a few miles south, and an aqueduct conducted the steaming water into the city. But by the time the water reached the city, it was lukewarm, just right to bathe in, <laughs> but sickening to drink. Paul mentions Laodicea in Colossians 4, verse 16, and there he tells the believers in Colossae that he has also sent a letter to Laodicea and that he wants them to exchange letters. So, the letter of Paul to the Colossians could just as well be called the letter of Paul to the Laodiceans. In the 14th century AD, the city was destroyed by the Turks and never was rebuilt. So with this background in mind, let's listen to the message of Jesus to Laodicea in Revelation 3, verse 14 and following. Over the past few weeks, we have sat in the pews of six of the seven churches. But today, as we listen to the message to the church in Laodicea, we sit in the pews of our own home church because we also live in the period of history represented by Laodicea. First of all, what picture of Jesus do we need to see? You remember that each of the seven churches is divided into seven parts. And the first part is the picture of Jesus that that church needs to see. Revelation 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So, we need to see Jesus as first, the amen, second, the faithful and true witness, and third, the beginning of God's cre creation. Well, what do these mean? The amen. When we study about faith in the Old Testament, we discover that the Hebrew word amen is related to the word believe, and it means sure and certain. In Revelation 7, verse 9, Moses told the people of Israel, Know therefore that Yahweh your God, he is God the faithful God. And that word faithful, the root of the word translated faithful is amen. Israel your God is sure and certain completely dependable. Your God is faithful. Have you ever seen a cat that's moving along and, and it comes to a place that it's not sure of and so it reaches its paw out and it tests, it tests the integrity of that surface in which it's thinking about standing? Is that trustworthy? God is trustworthy. God is faithful. Israel, your God is sure and certain, completely dependable, faithful. And Isaiah 65 verse 16 says, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. Now here again, the God of truth. Amen, the God of Amen. 
And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, the God of amen, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hid from my eyes. The God of truth, the God of faithfulness, they're both using the same word, amen. Elohe, amen. So what Jesus is saying is, these are the words of him who is the truth. What he says is totally dependable, and his message is to be accepted without question. Second, the faithful and true witness. A witness is someone who can testify to the facts because he's seen with his own eyes. And Jesus came to this earth as an eyewitness to what God is like. He is, in fact, God with us. In every word and action, he revealed the perfect love and patience and mercy of the Father. And his supreme witness was given when he was nailed to the cross, when he paid the penalty for our sins. In the New Testament, our word martyr comes from this word witness, martyria. And thousands who have given their lives for Christ have given their greatest and their best witness to his love through death. This is why we call them martyrs. Their death is a witness to the love and power of God, but not in the same sense as Jesus' death was. John says in his gospel in John 1 verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God, that can be either translated, some, some uh, manuscripts have only begotten God, some have old, only begotten Son. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He has made him known. When Jesus died, he died not only as a man, but as God, revealing God in a way that could not be equaled by any martyr. Jesus is the faithful and true witness, and he loves us so much that he doesn't beat around the bush when it comes to our salvation. He paid the supreme price for our salvation, and he can't rest as long as as those that he has purchased are in danger of neglected, neglect, neglecting the blood-bought pardon. He tells it like it is, so we will be able to see our true condition and come to him and be saved. Third is the beginning of God's creation. Jesus is the amen, he's the faithful witness, and third, he's the beginning of God's creation. What does that mean? The English word beginning could be misunderstood to mean that Jesus is the first thing that God created. But the word behind it is arche. Uh, it shows up in the word archbishop, which means the primary bishop, the ruling bishop. We also see it in the first part of the word arch enemy, means the number one enemy. It also appears in the word monarch, the only sole ruler. And also in archangel, archangel, the primary angel, the commander of the angels. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the origin of God's creation. I am the source of God's creation. I am the sole ruler of God's creation. John says, all things come into being, came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being, John 1 verse 3. And Paul said, by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. Jesus is saying, not only am I the amen, 
the one who is completely dependable and whose message is to be accepted without question, not only am I the faithful witness who doesn't beat around the bush when it comes to your salvation, but I am the one whose creative power brought everything seen and unseen into existence. And if you will admit the truth of what I am saying about you, saying to you, I have the power to do for you what you cannot possibly do for you, yourself, and that is to remedy the situation. I think we'd better listen to him, don't you? With these credentials, we can't afford not to listen. Now, there's no commendation for the church in Laodicea. Remember, there's seven parts, and even when the parts, part is missing, it's significant. You remember the church in uh, Sardis, uh, the the the, uh, the church in Smyrna, and the church in Philadelphia. The part that's missing is uh, something bad to say about them. Jesus has nothing bad to say about those two churches, but. In the message to Laodicea, there's no commendation. In fact, this is the only church for which Jesus has absolutely nothing good to say. And so what follows, follows comes in two parts. First, the rebuke, and then the counsel. Revelation 3, verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm, just like the water in your aqueduct. You aren't terribly bad, but you aren't terribly good either. You're not hostile toward me, but you aren't totally committed either. You aren't absolutely stingy, but you aren't enthusiastically generous either. You're not opposed to helping people, but you're not doing much for those who need it either. You're neither cold nor hot. The Laodiceans are like barely warm oatmeal very hard to swallow. In verse 15, he says, would that you were cold or hot. I really wish that you were either one or the other, he says. Now, why does he say that? It's easy to understand why he wishes we were hot. Then we would be eager to do good and glowing with our first love and full of praise and joy. But why would we wish, why would he wish for us to be cold? Well, maybe because then we would become uncomfortable enough to sense that something was wrong. How frustrating it must be for our Lord when he wants so much to help us, but he can't because we're too comfortable to realize our great need. Verse 16, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. You make me sick. You're nauseating to me. Why? Verse 17, for you say, I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing, not knowing that you are wretched and pitiable, poor and blind and naked. It's a beautiful fall day, and you're out on your front porch enjoying the fresh, crisp air while you can. And you hear what sounds like something, someone shuffling down the street. And you take a look around the bushes and what a frightful sight meet your, meets your eyes. And you leave the porch to go out onto the road to get a closer look. Here comes a poor man who hasn't who hasn't shaved for weeks, and as he approaches, you detect that he hasn't taken a bath for months, and his teeth, the ones that haven't fallen out, are a terrible sight. And it seems that his eyesight is nearly gone because he keeps bumping into things, and his eyes are red and weepy. And that isn't all. Not only is he wretched, wretched and pitiful and blind, but he's also naked, stark naked. And you think, 
Poor man, whatever could have happened to leave him in this condition? If someone doesn't do something quick to help him, he's never going to make it through the winter. And so you approach him. Sir, I don't know what has happened to you, but whatever it is, I'm here to help. Please come inside. You can use our shower and we'll give you some clothes to wear and some food to eat. And we'll get you some eye salve so that you can see where you're going. But instead of graciously accepting your generous offer, he becomes indignant. What do you mean? There's nothing wrong with me. I don't need any help. Can't you tell by the clothes I'm wearing that I'm a rich man? I have everything I need. And what's more, I've earned it. I've worked hard for everything I have. Who are you to suggest that I need anything from you? And at that point, you conclude that not only is he miserable and pitiful and blind and naked, but he's ignorant as well. He doesn't know. What more could you do but let him shuffle on down the road to face the long, cold winter in his sorry condition. Unless he realizes what he's really like, you can't do a thing for him. And that's just the way it is for us Laodiceans. Jesus is holding up a mirror here in these verses to help us to realize our complete undoneness apart from him. He's trying to help us to see the absurdity of thinking that we're pretty good people, spiritually rich and in need of nothing. He's trying to help us to see the foolishness of thinking that we can do anything to contribute to our own salvation. And if we realize that without him we can do nothing, we're ready for the counsel of the true witness. By the way, who of us can look in this mirror that Jesus holds up in these verses and say, that's not me? The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and continue to fall short of the glory of God. Of ourselves, we're all wretched and miserable and blind and naked. And the only question is, have you followed the counsel? The counsel begins in verse 18. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. What is this gold that we need to buy? Well, we find it in Zechariah 4, verses 1 to 3. And the angel who talked with me came again and waked me like a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps which are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And then verse 12, And a second time I said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the gold is poured out. Now I know in, in your translation it probably says the golden oil, but in the original language it just says the golden pipes from which the gold is poured out. The gold is the golden oil that keeps our lampstand burning brightly. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives who gives us the faith and the love that can only come from Jesus. And it is when we possess the pure gold of faith that works by love, refined in the fires of tribulation, that we are truly rich. Verse 18, the last part of verse 18, Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich. 
and white garments to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen. White garments. What is this? It's the perfect righteousness of Jesus that is given to us as a free gift. Also in Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 5, we find this robe of righteousness. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And Yahweh said to Satan, Yahweh rebuke you, O Satan. Yahweh who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with rich apparel. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments and the angel of Yahweh was standing by. There are two dimensions to this robe of righteousness. One dimension has to do with justification. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one should boast, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. When we come to Jesus just the way we are, miserable, pitiful, blind, and naked, Realizing our great need of him, he covers us with his robe of righteousness. All our guilt is taken away, and he looks at us in Jesus just as if we had never sinned. And as long as we continue to come to him and continue to be, we continue to be clothed in that robe of perfect righteousness, then there is the second dimension, and that is the dimension that has to do with sanctification. In Revelation 19, verse 8, it says, it was granted to her, that is the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. When Jesus gives us his righteousness, not only are we covered with his perfection, but through his creative power, our actions begin to be more and more his actions. The same loving deeds that he did, we also begin to do in order to bring glory to him who has saved us. And now... Once again, Revelation 3, verse 18. Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see so that we can see. It is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to see things as they really are. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. To those of us who once thought we were rich, he presents himself to us as the only source of true riches. To those of us who once thought that we could see plainly he offers us the only thing that will allow us to truly see things as they really are. To those of us who once thought that we could make some of the finest garments in the world on our own with our prized black wool, he offers the pure white robes of his own righteousness. 
and he advises us to buy all of this from him. Buy? I thought salvation was a free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. But Isaiah says in Isaiah 50, 55 verse 1, God says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Yes, it's free. There's absolutely nothing we can do to deserve it, but it costs everything we have. Just like the man who found a treasure in the field and sold everything he had so that he could buy the field and have the treasure. We surrender all we are to him and he gives us all he is. And he gives us all he has. Revelation 3, verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and, and, and chasten. So be, de- so be zealous and repent. The word chasten in the King James and discipline in the New, New American Standard Bible comes from a word that was used in connection with the training of children. It was not something that was done in anger. Not something that happens when someone loses his temper. Rather, it means vigorous, loving discipline that leads to repentance. Revelation 3, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. There are two doors mentioned in the messages to the seven churches. The open door in heaven, mentioned in the message to Philadelphia that leads into the most holy place of the sanctuary in heaven. And the door mentioned here. One door, no one can shut. And the other, only you can open. The first door Jesus opened for you by his blood so that you may enter into eternal life and communion with him. The second door you are to open so that Christ may enter to bring you eternal life. The door in heaven stands wide open. But what about the door of your heart? Jesus has made the long journey to our doorstep by way of the cross. You can see him out there now. He's carrying presents white garments, isav, and gold. And as concerned as he is for the salvation of the whole world, he still has as much time for each one as we have for him. And anyone, if anyone opens the door, he says, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He won't push his way in uninvited. He waits for an invitation. Won't you let him in just now? If you do, he has a wonderful promise for you. It's found in verse 21 of Revelation 3. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. As we come to the close of these seven messages, won't you say with me, Lord, I've heard you speaking to me through these special messages. I feel my great need of you. I need that gold of faith and love and the white garments of your righteousness and the eye salve of your Holy Spirit to be able to distinguish clearly between right and wrong. I hear you knocking and I want to invite you in so that our relationship can be closer than ever before. Let's respond to the gracious invitation of Jesus as we sing that song of invitation. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. It's number 289 in your hymnals. If you'd like to sing along, the Savior is waiting to enter your heart.
Let's sing together. Let's just bow our heads and invite him in. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your patience with us, and yet you don't beat around the bush. You tell us when we're off the track and you, you help us to get back in, back in where you want us to be. And so we want to accept that robe of righteousness that gold of your Holy Spirit and the eye salve of discernment. And we want to open the door. We want to open the door and let you in because you're standing at the door and knocking. Every day we want to do that. And not to go about our lives thinking that we can do it just about right. We know that we are sinners in need of you every day. Without you, we are and can do nothing. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will help us each day. Lift us up and keep our eyes upon Jesus that we may be clothed with your righteousness and not be found naked in that last day. We thank you for your promises to be with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us for this series on the seven churches, and uh, we'll soon have something else for you. So God bless you.